Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. This is organized by the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center. My name is Jeff Garris. I'm the Outreach Director at the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center. Um, originally, the content of this webinar was going to be presented at our March 19th, uh, 2020 Budget Summit, obviously with the coronavirus uh, pandemic in full swing and a lot of restrictions on place. We ended up postponing that. Uh, we'll be looking at doing another conference later on in the year. Uh, but we were able to take this particular presentation that was going to be one of the plenary presentations in the early afternoon, uh, and we've turned it into a webinar with folks from our research and policy team here to answer questions and to make the presentation today. In terms of questions, you'll notice on the right-hand side of the screen on the control panel for the GoToWebinar, uh, you have an area there that says questions. You can click on that and you can text a question. I'll be fielding questions and relaying them to our presenters. Uh, we have a lot of folks on the line today, so we'll uh, try to take as many questions as we can, but we may not be able to get to all of them. Uh, if you have any particular needs or questions that you wanna ask me directly, um, just do the click hand icon and I'll flip over the line and uh, check in with you there. Again, thanks for joining us. Uh, our presenters here today are our research and policy folks at the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center. We're pleased to have with us today PBPC, PBPC Director Mark Steer. We also have our Senior Policy Analyst Diana Paulson. And joining them today is uh, Dr. Stephen Hertzenberg, the Executive Director of the Keystone Research Center. I'm gonna turn it over to our team today uh, and thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, the uh, effort to c uh, contain the spread of COVID-19 uh, didn't just impact our budget and policy center budget summit last week. As you know, it's having a broad effect on not just our health, but on our economy. And that means the state budget. So instead of jumping into our usual analysis of the governor's budget proposal, which we do every year, we're going to start by talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the state and the budget based on a policy brief we released last week. Then we'll give an abbreviated analysis of the governor's budget proposal. We really have no idea at this moment what the budget debate will look like this year. Uh, as we'll point out, there are gonna be massive changes due to uh, declining state revenues as a result of the recession that's being created by our effort to contain COVID-19. But whatever direction it moves, the governor's proposal is likely to be the baseline by which changes are made so it, it would be useful to have this analysis of what the governor actually proposed in the context of the history of state budgeting in Pennsylvania. So let's go on to look at some of the challenges of COVID-19. Um, let's, as you can see on the next slide, uh, the biggest problem right now is that we need to slow the transmission of the infection to reduce the number of people who are sick and who need critical hospital care at any one moment. Uh, next slide, Jeff. As you can see from this slide, uh, there are a number of challenges of COVID-19. Uh, as you know, we need to slow the transmission of the infection to reduce the number of people who are sick and who need critical hospital care at any one moment. That's what we've been calling flattening the curve. Uh, in order to do that, we've been asking people to stay home. We've been asking people to keep their social distance from others. We've been closing businesses and uh, uh, we've been closing businesses and we've been basically in, in doing all that, uh, having a dramatic impact on our economy. Um, people can't work. Uh, in many cases, businesses are closed. Uh, economic output has been reduced dramatically. Um, we don't know how long this is going to go on. The estimates I've seen from the epidemiological uh, research and reports that have been put out is that this initial round of closures and social distancing may go on from May uh, into July. Uh, and it may happen again. We may find out that uh, in June or July when the first round ends, uh, we can get out for a couple of weeks and then the virus comes back and we have to have another round of social distancing and business closures. It could even happen a third time. And this could continue to happen until a vaccine and or a good treatment for COVID-19 is found. And that estimate is that uh, it won't happen for another 18 months. 
So as I said, this will have a devastating impact on our economy. And it's particularly gonna be felt by those who have low incomes, who are black and brown, who are women, who are disabled, who are elderly. There's no question that the impact on jobs is particularly harming people uh, with lower incomes, people in the working class, uh, both in the service sector and the goods producing sector. Um, and it's also hurting small and local businesses that are shut down during this effort to suppress the disease. So what should we do? As you can see on the next slide, the first thing we need to do is take some immediate steps to relieve distress. Uh, one thing we need is we need public health spending. Uh, we were distressed to find out in the last two weeks that Pennsylvania is fourth from the bottom in public health spending. This is the spending that goes to such important things as uh, tracking who has the disease, testing people, reporting on it, giving people information. Um, we don't know whether uh, Pennsylvania has the funds to, to do this work at the level it should. At the moment, it appears that Governor Wolf has been doing a really good job in keeping us informed and in getting information. But frankly, uh, we're concerned that without more funding for public health spending uh, over the long term, over the 6, 12, or 18 months this uh, crisis gonna, is going to take place, we may not have the funds we need. And the General Assembly may need to produce more money for that purpose. Second thing we have to do is make sure that health care is available to everyone. And that is important, not just for the individuals who need health care, who get the disease, but also for all of us. We're all depending on everyone else getting good health care in order to stop the spread of the disease. And our view is that everyone should be able to get that health care. Everyone should be able to get testing and treatment, regardless of whether they're insured. And there should be no co-pays or deductibles for those who have insurance or who are not insured as well. Uh, and that includes providing health care for immigrants, whether they're documented or undocumented. It's critical, again, for everyone to get health care if any of us are going to be protected. Finally, we think we need to deal with the economic distress caused by uh, COVID-19. Um, there's a lot we could do uh, immediately in the state. We can limit evictions and foreclosures. Um, we can limit layoffs uh, on the part of state contractors and school districts. We've heard some distressing news from Western Pennsylvania that a school that's closed has now laid off its, its, uh, much of its staff, not, uh, not the faculty yet, but the support staff. We think that's wrong. Um, schools are funded, they can keep paying people and they need to keep paying people in order to help those people deal with their, their daily lives and, and supporting themselves, but also to keep money injected into the economy. There's a lot of things we could do to improve our social safety net. Now, how much we can do depends on new funding from uh, the federal government, and I'll be talking a little bit about that in just a moment. But I want to just point out that there's a lot the state can do if it gets the money to move um, money to people who, who need it. We have a lot of safety net programs, uh, unemployment compensation, SNAP, which used to be called food stamps, temporary assistance to needy families, TANF. LIHEAP, which provides help for people heating their homes. Um, we can uh, expand the benefits in these programs. We can expand eligibility as far as we can under federal law, and perhaps federal government will give us the opportunity to expand it to more people. So for example, we could provide unemployment compensation for uh, gig workers and for um, self-employed people. Um, and then we can make it easier to get on these programs. Uh, we can reduce the waiting time to secure benefits. Uh, unemployment compensation has a one week waiting period. We can eliminate that waiting period, for example. Um, and then we can um, make it easier for people to get on the program by reducing verification requirements. At some point, we'll want people to show that they were in fact unemployed and to, to show what their previous income was. But we can waive and delay those requirements for now, allow people to get the, bet the money they need almost immediately, and then have them do the verification later. We also, of course, need to replace in-person contact with phone and internet communication when people are applying for all these benefits. Uh, that's important both to prevent clients and workers at county assistant offices. We don't want our county assistant offices to become vectors of the disease. Um, finally, we can, we can help small businesses with a low interest loan program for them. The state can borrow right now at very low interest rates, and the state should take advantage of that and create a program that enables small business people who've had to close as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, to borrow money 
and then pay it back gradually at low interest rates to tie them over these economic difficulties. Now, keep in mind, um, these economic distress measures aren't, are crucially about making it possible for people who are really uh, badly hurt by the epidemic to survive, to feed their families, to keep their homes, uh, to, to stop from getting evicted. But it's also about economic recovery. Um, as we go into the next slide, you can see that one of the things we're concerned about is the impact of COVID-19 on the economy and also on state budget issues. We know the economy is entering a recession. We don't know how deep it is. It will be. We don't know how long it will last. Um, how long it lasts depends on how long we have to keep engaging in this uh, pattern of closing businesses and social distancing, how many times we need to do it. Uh, how deep it is depends on, frankly, how effective all our measures are in stopping the spread of the disease. The more effective we are in shutting down businesses and, and um, social distancing, frankly, the, the more devastating the impact on the economy will be. And what we have to do is ensure not only that people are, are able to survive during this period, and particularly those who are most likely to be, to be hurt, that low-income people, black and brown people, women, disabled, the elderly, we have to ensure that the economy can recover quickly. And those two things are connected because if we put money in people's hands so they keep paying their rent and paying their mortgage and buying food and buying gasoline if they need it, um, when the, when the uh, closures end and businesses reopen, the economy will be able to pick up very quickly. If, on the other hand, we've devastated a, a large portion of the population, and by the way, some of the estimates we've heard is that unemployment could reach 20% in the next month or so. That's depression levels of that unemployment. If we ha help those people who are unemployed survive and, and continue to purchase goods and services, then when the closures come off, the economy will revive very quickly. Now, there's some state budget issues here as well. We're expecting a significant reduction in state revenues. It's very hard to estimate at this point because, again, we don't know uh, how deep the recession will be. But simply by looking at the last two recessions and estimating about where we would fall between them, we may be looking at a reduction in state revenues of between 23 and $3.5 billion. There'll also be additional expenditures. Things like Medicaid will, will cost the state more money as more people lose their jobs, lose their insurance, and have to join the Medicaid system. Um, we hope there'll be enough federal aid to sustain the state in, in providing all the goods and services it does now. Um, but it's very important that if the federal money does not come through, that we in fact take measures to raise funds within the state so as to avoid cutting the state budget. We do not do what, want to do what we did in 2010, 2011, when after federal recovery funds from the Great Recession ran out, we saw massive cuts in state spending. We saw a billion dollar cut in spending for K-12 education that cost us 26,000 jobs. We saw deep cuts to the safety net of three to $500 million. We saw a couple hundred million dollars cuts to higher education. All those things were devastating in two ways. Number one, they reduced spending in the state and thus made the recession deeper and longer. And number two, they undermine programs that are absolutely critical for growing the economy in the future. We've got to be educating our kids. We've got to be educating uh, people who go to college and making it possible for people to go to college. That's critical to long-term economic productivity in, in the state. It's critical long-term growth. It's critical to all of our wages and all of our income. And so we are uh, very insistent that the state must not cut the budget this year, must find alternate fund sources of revenue. And one thing we're suggesting is uh, if we do need alternate sources of revenue, the fair share tax that we at Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center have been uh, supporting for a number of years should be considered as a main revenue rate raiser. Uh, that's our plan to raise taxes on what we call income from wealth. Um, we believe we could raise $2.3 billion from uh, in new revenue by mostly from the top 1% and the next 4%, about 80% of that $2.3 billion would come from uh, people making $360,000 a year or more in the state. And at the same time, we could reduce taxes on working people, giving them a little bit more money to spend, which will help them get through this difficult time, but also help restart our economy. So that's the state budget issues. We can turn next to a couple of federal federal issues. 
I also often mention also I, I already mentioned that um, we're expecting a lot of money from the state to sustain the state from the federal government rather to sustain the state budget. And that's really critical. There's been a lot of talk about sending checks to people. Um, and I have to say checks to people in general is not enough. It's not, uh, it, it might be useful for many of us, but it's not all the federal government should do. First of all, because they're not targeted to uh, the people who most need it. And then and they may not be in place long enough for those who most need it. A thousand dollar check now, a thousand dollar check. Uh, I should say a thousand dollar check in April, a thousand dollar check in July. Um, will help, but for those who are unemployed for six, 12, maybe 18 months, uh, it's not gonna help enough. For those who can't afford food over six, 12 or 18 months, a couple of checks is not gonna help. We need to target the money to people who need it. We also have to deliver it quickly. One of the problems with checks is that, uh, from the federal government is that we don't have a system set up to send those checks. The last time we had to do this, we passed the law in February, the checks did not come to April. If the federal government provides funds for our safety net, for unemployment insurance, for TANF, for SNAP, uh, that money can go out, start going out to people within two or three weeks. It'll be in their hands, they'll start spending it. They'll be relieved from the economic distress of this difficult moment and, this, and spending will continue in the state, keeping our economy afloat. The other problem with sending checks is uh, they're not easy to deliver to people who don't pay federal income taxes. And, a large number of people don't pay federal income taxes and those don't have to file for uh, uh, income taxes and the federal government may not have information for them to actually send them a check. And we're talking about some of the lowest income and most vulnerable people in the state. So che checks going out to taxpayers is simply not enough. Um, we need to use the, um, the social safety net. And we also need to provide funding for the states the way we did during the Great Recession. Uh, for a couple of years when money from the uh, Recovery Act actually made it possible for the state to continue spending without uh, budget cuts. It was only when that federal stimulus money ran out that we actually had the deep cuts in the, in the federal budget. So we're looking to Washington right now and when discussions are happening in the Senate and the House to, and asking our legislators and asking the president to make sure that they fund the safety net and fund the states. What else can we do? If we go on to um, look at some long-term steps on the next slide, uh, there's some policies that really should have been in place already, things we've been talking about for a long time. One is mandated sick days, another is paid family and medical lead, leave, another is to expand the basic uh, TANF or temporary assistance to needy families benefit and restore the general assistance program that we cut last year. And a, a fourth is ramping up investment in public infrastructure. Uh, all these things are things the state needs. If they were in place now, the economic impact of the pandemic would be far less than it is. People would be able to take sick days. They would get assistance if they, um, they or their family members are sick. Uh, the tariff benefits would be higher already. We'd be building things, and some of this construction could even continue during the pandemic because people are somewhat isolated from another, one another. Um, these are programs that should have been in place. We can put them in place now and we can find the funds in ways I've described to ramp them up as quickly as possible. And they would also help relieve the economic distress of people in Pennsylvania and ensure that our government, our, our co government economy get restarted as quickly as possible. Um, so we can move on from the from the COVID issue to the budget issue, but Jeff, I could stop here and see if there are any questions before I move on. Yes, that would be great, Mark. Um, we got a few of these that folks have submitted via the question box. Um, let me just bring that up on screen now. Okay. Um, one of the questions uh, that we got uh, via the question box was, um, how would we send out this money? What mechanisms would be used? Would state workers be required to do means testing? Um, and what about state workers who are in danger right now? Um, well, the mechanism is uh, to use the, the programs already in place. And, and that's a really good question because it points out that we have unemployment insurance, we have temporary needy families, we have SNAP, we have LIHEN. Uh, 
those programs are in place. There's means for people to apply for them and means for them to get check, checks uh, and other assistance from the, from the state government very quickly. And that's why we're recommending using them. Those are, in fact, means-tested programs. And I know a lot of folks are saying, well, it would be much better if we had a, a social welfare system that was universal without means testing. And while as a theoretical matter, I agree with that, um, we are in an emergency. And in that emergency, I think we need to do two things. We need to get money out quickly, and we need to get it to people who most need it. And the existing programs will enable us to get it out quickly. Uh, the state, as soon as the federal government says you can, you have more money for unemployment insurance and you can raise benefits, the state has to adjust its computers. It takes about a week, and then the money will flow. And that is absolutely the fastest way to get people money. And it's the fastest way to get it to people who need it. Now, the other part of the question, protecting workers is really important. There, there are ways for people to apply for these benefits um, without human intervention uh, through the internet, uh, by talking to people on the phone. Uh, very few people absolutely have to come in uh, to get an interview at a county assistance office. And the state can waive those interviews and, and change regulations to delay them until after the pandemic is over. Um, another question that was submitted uh, is uh, the question, are there actions in county or municipal toolkits uh, that can be used to help? Um, I would say the most important thing the counties and municipal governments and the school districts should do is keep paying people. Keep paying their workers, even if they're not working, even if they have to stay at home, don't lay people off. Uh, you have money in your budget to pay these po folks over the course of the year, keep doing it. Uh, keep doing it because you need good workers and uh, if you start firing people, you may not get them back. And keep doing it because um, they, they don't deserve to bear the burden of this uh, terrible pandemic. And keep doing it because it'll keep the rest of your economy and your county and municipality alive. So I think that's the most important thing. And one final question um, related to the uh, COVID-19 recommendations. A question that's being asked is, can college campuses be repurposed as housing for healthcare workers who can work but need to be isolated from their own families? Uh, I think that depends on, on you know, where the college campuses are and where the hospitals are. Um, there, I've heard actually some hospitals encouraging uh, their nurses and doctors to, to sleep in, on call rooms and things like that, uh, to stay away from their families. Uh, but that's actually an interesting suggestion and uh, we can pass it along to, to folks uh, that might be very useful in, in places where there are college campuses very close to, to hospitals and other medical centers. Thank you, Mark. Uh, those are all of the questions that we had submitted up till this point. So thank you. Okay, great. So let's go ahead, uh, go on to the next slide, and then we're going to start the uh, overview of the Governor Wolf's proposed 2020-21 budget. And uh, I'll get it started, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, first, this is a, a, a overview of the whole Pennsylvania operating budget. Um, you notice down at the bottom in the second column, the total operating budget is $89.3 billion. Uh, of that, $58.5 billion is, comes from the state. $30.8 billion comes from federal funds. Of those state funds, mm. the biggest chunk comes from the general fund budget, and that's the budget we're mostly going to talk about today. But people should know that the uh, motor license fund, the lottery fund, and about 130 other special funds make up a significant share of the, the state budget. Those funds are monies dedicated to certain purposes um, um, or coming from special places like the lottery fund. Uh, the great area where there's a lot of possibility for change is in the general fund, and that's what we're going to be mostly talking about. The other thing I want to point out is if you look down again at the bottom row in the third column, the total combined operating budget of the state is only going up 2.4%. That's actually not much more than inflation. But if you look at the different components of it, you can see state funds are going up at 3.27%. The general fund is going up at 4.21%. That's above inflation. But it's not because the state is 
doing more. It's actually because if you look at the third line from the bottom, federal funds in the third column, that's only going up 0.79%. Uh, the federal government has been reducing money to the states and, and that's putting more of a burden on state government. And that's why we have to raise more money internally from, the from uh, our taxpayers and the general fund has to get a little larger in order to provide the same levels of services that we've provided in the past. If you go to the next slide, uh, it, it will answer a, a question that people always ask, uh, or not actually answer an accusation people often make. They say government is getting out of control, it's growing bigger and bigger, it's taking over more of our lives. As this chart shows, that's absolutely not true. The best way to understand the impact of the government is not look at the absolute amount of money, because that goes up simply because of inflation. But look at what share of the gross state product, what share of everything we produce in the state actually flows through the state government. And if you look at general funds as a share of gross state product, you can see it actually has been declining substantially. Uh, between 1997 and 2011, uh, the state took almost 4.85% of the gross state product and ran it through state government. Now we're down to about 4%. Um, that's a cut of almost 12% uh, in, in, in the size of the state government relative to the economy. So in fact, um, we are spending less, we are taxing less. And that's why you see uh, one of the things that we uh, point to again and again in our full budget analysis. And that is that we have a persistent public investment deficit in the state. Uh, we have K to 12, uh, funding of our schools that's more unequal than anywhere else in the country. Um, rich districts get a, have, have a lot more funding per kid than poor districts, and that's because the state share of, of education funding is very low relative to other states. We are down at the bottom with regard to higher education spending. We are spending less on infrastructure, and we're certainly spending less on protecting our environment. And the reason for that is revenues keep dropping, so expenditures have to drop. And, and that is uh, what the fundamental fact of, of the state budget. If, if you come away from this presentation with one piece of information, I hope you know it's that the state is spending less and less and it's providing less and less and that we have a persistent public investment deficit as a result. Going on to the next slide, um, we can see, we're gonna talk about general fund revenues. Uh, and then in the next slide, you can see where those revenues mostly come from. You can see uh, the two biggest revenue sources are personal income tax and the sales tax. And uh, other taxes make up a much less portion of, this, of the budget. We wanna talk about one of those in particular, if you go on to the next slide. Uh, corporate taxes uh, now are pay about 15% of uh, the general fund revenues. Uh, if you go back to 1972, they were up to about 30% of general fund revenues. We've seen persistent cuts on corporate income taxes. One whole kind of corporate income tax, corporate tax was in fact uh, eliminated. And that's why we see this sharp decline. If we were hadn't done those things, if we were taxing at both the same rate as we did in 1972, if we hadn't done the, the tax cuts over the last 20 years, we would have an additional $4 billion in revenues going into state coffers. We would have the money to relieve the public investment deficit that I've talked about before. Next slide. Uh, corporate tax reform is part of the governor's budget proposal. Um, he proposes to lower the corporate net income tax rate uh, with regular decreases to 5.99%. Now that's a tax cut, but he wants to, in, in, do that at the same time we're creating something called combined reporting. You've probably heard us talk about the Delaware loophole, the fact that 73% of corporations operating in Pennsylvania don't pay any corporate taxes. Those are mostly, and, and those are entirely corporations that are not based in Pennsylvania. They're often based in Delaware, which is why we call it the Delaware loophole. Uh, and corp these multi-state in cases, multinational corporations don't show profits in Pennsylvania through accounting gimmicks that enable them to shift their profits either to Delaware or in some cases, the Cayman Islands and the Bahamas. And that enables them to avoid corporate income taxes in Pennsylvania. Combined reporting uh, in, in, at the same rate right, uh, that we have right now would bring in another $240 million in additional revenues. That's part of the governor's budget proposal. We think it's an important part and should be adopted, particularly this year when we're facing 
a budget crisis. Where we disagree with the governor, however, is we don't think the, the tax rate should be dropped quite as fast and quite as far as he believes. Um, some lowering of rates, of our relatively high rates might be justified, but we need to keep the rates high enough to ensure that the corporate sector is paying its fair share of taxes in Pennsylvania. Uh, moving on. Um, another important revenue component um, in the state budget is raising the minimum wage. Now, for many of us, it's, it's important not just as a revenue component, and I, that's where we'll start. As many of you know, the minimum wage has been stuck at $7.25 for over a decade. That's only a $15,000 annual income. It's not enough for any worker, let alone a worker with a family, to survive on. Uh, we have been calling for a long time for an immediate increase in the minimum wage to $12.00 with 50 cent increases each year until the uh, wage goes up to $15, this case in 2026. Uh, that's important for a number of reasons. It's important because it's a matter of equity. Uh, people shouldn't be paid so little in doing full-time work. It's important um, as, as a matter of helping pe working people support their families. Um, and it's also important because it brings in revenue to the state. Uh, the governor's budget estimates that a $12 minimum wage in 20, July 2020 would bring in $133 million in additional personal income and sales taxes. Now, we know people always say, well, that's going to cost jobs and that's going to cost employment and so forth. Um, one of the things we've shown at the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center and Keystone Research Center is that's just not true. And if you have any doubts about that, uh, go to our website, check out a document called Myth and Facts about the minimum wage. And you'll see all the evidence that we have that raising the minimum wage not only does not cost jobs, it actually may increase jobs and increases economic activity for the very simple reason that if you put money in people's hands, they'll spend it, local businesses will benefit, the economy will rise up as a whole. And again, that's a really important theme of everything we're saying. One of the reasons we keep saying we need to provide relief for the economic distress that people are facing is because we need to put money in their hands to keep the economy going at a time when people are losing their jobs and so forth. Moving on, um, uh, there's another revenue raising element in the budget that we should point to, and that's uh, uh, a fee assessed on every municipality uh, to provide state police protection. Um, in many municipalities in, in the state, you know, big cities like Philadelphia and, and Pittsburgh, we have local police forces. In, a vast majority of municipalities, mostly in rural areas, but some surprisingly in suburban areas, there are no local police forces. And the state police provides the local policing. So, uh, but local communities there don't pay any taxes for that uh, benefit. Whereas in, in, uh, in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and, and other places with local police forces, people are paying for both the local police and for the state police. Uh, we all think that's unfair. Governor Wolf thinks it's unfair, and he's proposing a fee uh, that would be um, assessed to different municipalities based on their population, how large the area is, and how much they uh, rely on the state police for state police protection. That would raise $136 million, and that's a critical part of the state budget proposal of Governor Wolf as well. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, uh, area, which is general fund expenditures. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview of those. Um, moving on, you can see that the budget that the governor has proposed uh, for the general fund is up by 4.2% 4 4 from the previous year. It would be a budget of $36.1 billion. Um, and if you, we can go on, Jeff, to look at some of the details. Uh, this pie chart shows us where the money goes. Um, there's an old joke that the federal government is a health insurance system uh, attached to a military. Well, and because that's where most federal money goes. Well, if you want to look at where does state money goes, it goes to education, it goes to health care, and it goes to our prisons. That's what the criminal justice is. Um, those three things make up the lion's share of the state budget. Everything else comes from the uh, about a quarter of the state budget. Um, and this gives you an idea of, of where those where your money goes when you pay state tax dollars. Uh, and with that, uh, I think I'm going to turn it over to Steve Hertzenberg, who's going to take it from here and look at some of the details of 
uh, some of the uh, areas of the budget, and then Diana Paulson will follow with some other areas of the state budget. Thanks. Oh, well, should we see if there are any questions at this point, Jeff? Uh, we don't have any questions specific to anything you were just talking about, Mark, so I think we're we're safe moving on. Okay, good. Let's move on to Steve then. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, higher education is the area in which Governor Wolf makes perhaps his most ambitious proposal to invest $204 million in scholarships for students to attend the state's four-year state system of higher education colleges. Backdrop to this proposal is Pennsylvania's giant underinvestment in higher education. The next chart shows that Pennsylvania ranks 48th for per capita investment in higher education. Um, that's the yellow bar near the bottom of this slide. That's roughly one fifth the level of leading states uh, at the top of the chart and only one half the national average. That's the yellow line uh, that Jeff's pointing to in the middle there. Thanks, Jeff. Um, from this underinvestment flow a series of negative consequences for Pennsylvania individuals and families, our businesses, our communities, and the state as a whole. Pennsylvania ranks uh, third to sixth highest for tuition and fees at the state's two and four year public colleges. Debt among college students graduating from Pennsylvania's four year colleges averages over $37,000, second highest in the nation. Lack of access to affordable college contributes to Pennsylvania's rank of 40th among states for the share of adults ages 25 to 64 with any education beyond a high school degree. In more than half of Pennsylvania counties, most of them rural, the share of adults with more than a high school degree is lower than in any of the 50 states. These rural counties face a double whammy of high cost and lack of access, either having no community college presence at all or only a branch campus where students must pay double tuition. Low educational attainment correlates with poor economic outcomes for regions and for individuals, lower economic growth, lower wages, higher unemployment. Unaffordable college goes along with an alarming erosion of higher education's historic role as an engine of intergenerational mobility. Uh, even Pennsylvania's four-year state system colleges cater more now to the rich, the opposite of their historic role in helping working class students enter the middle class. These challenges are why, in what is otherwise a status quo higher education budget, Governor Wolf proposes to repurpose $204 million from the Pennsylvania Racehorse Development Trust Fund to financial assistance for students who qualify for federally subsidized student loans and who attend a state system college full time. In design, the Nellie Bly scholarship proposal is like, but less broad than, the Pennsylvania Promise Free Tuition Program which Keystone Research Center and the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center proposed in January 2018, and which is incorporated now in proposed House and Senate legislation. Nellie Bly is a last dollar program, like the PA Promise. State assistance under Nellie Bly would kick in after students access federal support. It would help fill the gap between existing financial aid and the full cost of tuition, fees, room, board, books, and other costs. Students who benefit from the program must stay in Pennsylvania for the same number of years for which they receive the benefit. We think this is a great, sorely needed proposal, but urge the legislature and the governor to consider several modifications. First, allow part-time or full-time community college students to qualify for Nellie Bly scholarships consistent with the PA Promise model. This is a matter of fairness to the lower income students that community colleges serve many of those students the first in their family to go to college. Fairness also to the working adults who can only afford to go to college part-time. Uh, providing scholarships to community college students would also leverage more federal funds and a higher ratio of federal to state funds. Um, the next chart shows that students, or this chart I should say, shows that students at Pennsylvania public colleges draw down 256 million less than they would if they drew down Pennsylvania's population-based share. So let me slow down a little bit to make sure that people follow this. Uh, that chart shows uh, in the dark blue, currently uh, the total Pell Grant value drawn down by Pennsylvania uh, college students at public colleges is $451 million a year. 
if uh, Pennsylvania students at those colleges drew down as big a share of the national Pell pot as our share of the population, uh, we would be getting over $700 million total. So we're leaving on the table, as it were, uh, the $256 million in the light blue uh, at the top of the chart. Um, another recommendation, second recommendation um, uh, to modify the Nellie Bly proposal is that scholarships be open to students of all immigration statuses. While students of all immigration statuses are not all currently eligible for most finan federal financial aid for college, Pennsylvania should, should ensure that they are eligible for its college affordability programs. Maryland enacted a bill last year which provides model language. Penn State enacted a policy this January to make in-state students with all immigration statuses eligible for in-state tuition. These policies are a matter of fairness for dreamers brought to the United States by their parents before age 18. The policies are also a good investment. After the current economic collapse, Pennsylvania's, uh, given Pennsylvania's aging population, immigrants will be an increasingly important part of the workforce. They are critical to avoiding a rapid decline in the state's population. Ensuring that young immigrants have the skills needed for the jobs of tomorrow will be vital to Pennsylvania's economic growth over the next several decades. A third modification um, to Nellie Bly. Um, we think it should fold in the implementation of credible local efforts to create new community colleges where they don't exist, including in places like Erie and Sunbury. Uh, over more than a decade in those two cases, uh, good people locally, coalitions of civic leaders, businesses, educators um, have been putting in place um, the local funds and the detailed plans necessary for a local college um, in the context of a big investment in public higher education, um, they should be rewarded with uh, the formal establishment of community colleges uh, and those should be the delivery mechanism for the expanded program made possible programming made possible by Nellie Bly scholarships. Uh, the state should also allocate program development funds to create new Pell eligible, eligible programs um, at community college sponsoring tuition rates in higher education deserts where no local community college organizing effort yet exists. Um, our budget analysis argues that the silver lining of Pennsylvania's higher education underinvestment is that we can ramp up the needed investment in ways adapted to current conditions and leapfrog better funded systems. Many pieces exist on which a leapfrog could build. The bottom-up efforts to create new community colleges, the decentralized delivery system of the Northern Pennsylvania Regional College adapted for the low population density part of Pennsylvania's northern tier to Erie's east, and the state's recent investment in better linking education to the skills and careers of tomorrow, STEM education, career and technical education, pre-apprenticeship, apprenticeship, industry partnerships, and teacher in the workplace initiatives. For rural places in Pennsylvania, such a higher education leapfrog could not only expand college access to its rural students, but also tip the balance from a vicious circle of disinvestment and population loss to a virtuous, cir virtuous circle of reinvestment and renewal. In sum, we recommend the legislature implement an expanded Nellie Bly proposal as a vital and self-conscious step towards a model 21st century integrated Pennsylvania system of grade uh, 11 through 16 education for college, career, and life. Our budget analysis also addresses the governor's workforce development and economic development proposals, but for reasons of time, I'm not gonna drill down into those proposals here. Uh, at this point, um, um, uh, there are no questions or we're keeping questions until the end. I think I will hand things over to my colleague. We Diane. actually have one quick one quick okay. question for you here, Steve. Yeah. Um, someone submitted a question. Uh, the question is, why does Pennsylvania not receive the full Pell Grant funds that it would be eligible for? Okay, that's a great question. Um, it's really uh, two factors. Um, in the end, um, the number of Pell Grant dollars uh, students at public colleges draw down depends in part on uh, how many students fill out the federal financial aid form and apply for a federal uh, Pell Grant. 
And there are two basic reasons that smaller shares of Pennsylvania students um, fill out the federal financial aid form and apply for Pell Grants. One reason is that in those over 20 rural counties that don't even have an expensive branch campus of a community college, um, often there are no uh, affordable nearby uh, Pell eligible programs. So a, a lot of high school students or other working adults simply never try to get a Pell Grant. Um, the second reason is back to the underfunding of higher education, public higher education generally, um, and the high tuition. Everywhere in the state, the fact that it's expensive to go to public college uh, likely holds down application for Pell Grants everywhere. So th those are the two main reasons that we're leaving that $256 million on the table. Thanks, Steve. I think that's all the questions we had. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to walk you through some of the details of the governor's proposed spending for education, human services, and a couple of other areas. Um, so Governor Wolf has made education funding a key priority during his time in office. And this year he proposes increases to K through 12, early education and higher education funding as Steve just talked about. Um, while this additional funding moves us in the right direction, we still face inadequate and unequal funding of K through 12 schools in Pennsylvania. So this graph shows the year to year funding for the pre-K to 12 budget Governor Wolf proposes a total pre-K um, to 12 budget of nearly $13 billion, which is a 2.1% increase from last year. And if you look at the next chart, um, this looks specifically at K through 12 classroom spending. So this is state expenditures that support what happens inside the classroom. So it excludes things like transportation and pension costs. Um, the governor proposes a $6.6 .6 billion investment in K-12 classroom funding for 2020-2021. Um, and this is a $100 million increase from last year. <clears throat> On this chart, you can also see the drastic cuts to classroom funding um, from Corbett, Corbett in 2011-12 which um, as many of you I'm sure know well, um, you know, as a result of these cuts, tens of thousands of school teachers, guidance counselors, and school nurses were laid off, uh, which we still haven't made up for today. So this is something we need to think about as we head into a recession. We don't want to cut spending like this again when our school funding is already inadequate and inequitable. So you can see there have been incremental funding increases over the last decade, but it wasn't until 2018-19 that these cuts were finally restored in nominal dollars. Um, moving on, um, let me give you some context on uh, Pennsylvania's education system. Uh, Pennsylvania ranks 44th in the nation for state, the state share of total K through 12 funding. So the state provides a relatively low share of state funding for K through 12, 39% compared to the national average of 47%. So this means that local governments have to raise the rest of the needed funds uh, through property taxes um, primarily. Uh, and if enough funds can't be raised, programs are often cut. So this over-reliance on local funding for schools contributes to great inequities in funding. In fact, um, I think Mark had mentioned, Pennsylvania has the greatest disparity in per-student funding between our wealthy and our poor school districts. Uh, moving on, um, in an effort to address some of these inequities in school funding, Pennsylvania enacted the FAIR funding formula in 2016. And this requires that all new basic education funding run through a formula that takes into account each district's distinct needs. So that includes um, uh, taking into consideration the number of kids living in poverty, the number of English language learners, the overall wealth of the district, um, 
So this chart shows the amount of money running through this fair funding formula. Remember, the formula only applies to new money and is in light blue at the top of the bars. So as you can see, the amount of money running through the funding formula is increasing each year. But this year, the amount running through the for fair funding formula only represents 12.6% of basic education funding. So if you move on, um, we wanted to see how this funding formula plays out and is or is not addressing inequities. Um, so Jeff, if you could move on to the next graph. Um, so we created are you, are you hearing me, Jeff? Oh, here we go. There it is. Um, so to see how this funding formula played out um, and is or is not addressing inequities, we created um, the previous chart. Jeff. Hey Jeff, I'm just going to wait till I see the correct chart. There we go. Okay, so to see how this funding formula plays out and is or is not addressing um, inequities, we created this chart to look specifically at racial equity in school funding. Um, racial equity is the condition that would be achieved if one's racial identity no longer predicted in a statistical sense how one fares. So here we divided the school districts in half um, by those with a sh higher share of students of color, and these schools average 30% non-white students, and those with a lower share, averaging about 5% non-white students. As you can see, total per student basic education funding is higher in school districts with a low share of students of color. In fact, it is $1,182 lower per student. And you can also see in light blue at the top of the bars the amount of funding going through the fair funding formula. So it is higher in school districts with a higher share of students of color, but not enough funding is going through the formula at this point to make up for um, existing disparities. So if we move on, um, you know, one of the questions um, that's important to ask is how much funding do schools actually need to address to address these inequities and make sure that every student, regardless of their race, zip code, or income, receives adequate funding. So the Public Interest Law Center has calculated this based on an average of current school spending per student in districts that perform well. And they also um, weight that to take into account such factors like the share of students living in poverty. Um, the total estimates to get us as a state to adequacy is $3.8 billion uh, we need in new school funding. So this figure divides up Pennsylvania's 500 school districts into groups of 125 based on those living in poverty. So you see the high poverty districts are on the left and the low poverty districts are on the right. And as you can see, the amount of funding needed in high poverty districts is significantly higher than that in low poverty districts. It's also important to note that even low poverty school districts need more funding to adequately educate all of their students. Okay, moving on. Um, uh, Governor Wolf proposed another, uh, a number of other K through 12 education initiatives, and um, one of those is charter school reform. Um, so there are several proposed changes the governor is suggesting to address how charter schools are reimbursed, specifically around special education and cyber charters. Uh, charter schools currently pay a flat rate for each student needing special education, even though the level of needs and services varies for each child. This flat rate means charter schools are overpaid for students who need fewer services and underpaid for those who need more extensive services. So this gives charter schools a financial incentive to enroll students who require less services. So Governor Wolf this year proposes using the four-tiered special education funding formula that school dis districts currently use to align charter school funding more closely with the needs of the special education students that are enrolled in their schools. 
Uh, cyber charters have grown tremendously in recent years, as many of us know, um, but conducting online education has significantly fewer costs than brick and mortar schools, yet they are currently being funded at the average cost per pupil in a district. So Governor Wolf is proposing a statewide flat rate for cyber charter schools of $9,500 per student per year. Uh, together, these changes will result in savings for school districts of $280 million. Um, it's important to note also that if this proposal does not go through, we should find other sources of funding to help school districts. Uh, moving on, um, there's a couple of other K-12 through changes that Governor Wolf has proposed. Um, one is a lead and asbestos cleanups in schools. Another one is uh, universal kindergarten. And uh, Governor Wolf also proposes increasing the minimum teacher salary um, from its current minimum, which is $18,500 per year, um, which works out to be less than $9 per hour. Um, and he wants to increase that to $45,000 per year. Um, and this would help to attract and retain qualified teachers across Pennsylvania. So now we're going to talk about special education funding. Um, School districts are mandated by state and federal law to cover the cost of special education for students who need it. So there's been significant growth in the need for special education services, yet state funding has not kept pace with this growth. And this puts school districts in more financial stress. In fact, the state share of special education funding has fallen from 32% in 2008-9 to just 23% in 2017-18. So this figure shows um, Governor Wolf proposes an increase of 2.1% from last year for special education. Since taking office, um, Governor Wolf and the legislature have increased funding for special education by $165 million, or about 16%. Um, but despite this investment, state funding is not keeping up with growing costs, with this, which is a hardship on um, school districts. So moving on to the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about early childhood education. Um, as this graph shows, there have been significant investments in early childhood education, uh, which has more than doubled since Governor Wolf took office. Um, and that's given us more than 13,000 kids access to pre-K services. Uh, this year, the governor proposes a $30 million increase, or 11%. Um, and this includes $25 million for pre-K counts and $5 million for the Head, uh, Head Start Supplemental Program. And this would open up an additional um, about 3,200 slots for pre-K statewide. Okay, now I'm going to move on to human services. Um, the governor's proposed budget includes $14.37 billion for the Department of Human Services. And this makes up nearly 40% of the proposed general fund budget. And this pie chart shows where human service dollars are being spent. Um, as you can see, more than half, uh, around 58% of DHS spending goes towards medical assistance and long-term living. And the next biggest piece of the pie is for intellectual disabilities. Um, if we move on to the next slide, uh, the budget includes a proposed increase to medical assistance of 17.4%, and this is the biggest proposed increase in the DHS budget. And much of this increase is due to planned decreases in the federal matching rate for Medicaid, CHIP, and Medicaid expansion. Um, moving on, um, so the governor has proposed a 10% increase in funding for intellectual disabilities. This includes $15 million to move 732 individuals with an intellectual disability, autism, or developmental delay from the emergency wait list to receive supports and services for independent living in their homes and communities. Um, on the next slide, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about early intervention. Early intervention for zero to three-year-olds um, is proposed to increase by $2.5 million for county administration. And just as some background, 
um, there was a funding increase of $64 million since the governor took office, resulting in a 30% increase in the number of kids receiving these services. Funding this year will help with administrative costs to keep up with that increase. An early intervention for three to five year olds, um, the governor proposes an $11 million increase to serve an additional 2,000 children. Um, moving on, um, the governor's budget has proposed a number of initiatives to address lead exposure across Pennsylvania. This includes um, cleaning up lead and asbestos in schools with $1 billion in grant money. Um, $4 million in state investment met with a $10 million federal match. Um, and this money would go towards reducing lead exposure through you know, more accessible testing, lead abatement activities, and outreach and education. Um, the governor proposes $90 million in grants to address lead and drinking water statewide. And this would be used to um, replace lead service lines. Pennsylvania has also applied for a federal, federal grant for a lead testing program in schools and child care centers. And if we were to receive that money, it would provide testing um, of at least 3,000 facilities statewide. So moving on, you know, uh, human services, um, there's a lot to it, um, but I'll point people to our report for more information. One thing that I did want to mention is that the governor proposes to use 23 million federal dollars to fund a work expense deduction, and that would allow TANF recipients to earn more money before they lose benefits. Um, and just as some background, you know, TANF family size allowances or the amount um, a family is eligible to receive in cash assistance has not changed since 1990. So this works out, for example, to be only $316 a month for a two-person family. Um, and to be eligible, one's income must be below the value of the grant. Um, so it takes recipients very few hours to, of work to lose eligibility. So this change will likely expand a work expense deduction, um, which means recipients can earn more before they lose uh, the benefit. Okay, moving on to environmental protection. Next slide. So I always like to start off when talking about environmental protection with what Article 1, Section 27 of the Pennsylvania Constitution states, which is this. Uh, the people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources are the common property of all the people, including generations yet to come. As trustee of these resources, the Commonwealth shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all the people. However, as we know, many communities across the Commonwealth face poor air quality, drinking water, and other environmental problems. And despite this, since 2002, DEP has experienced a 30% reduction in staff. That's uh, 900 less staff, despite even more environmental challenges that we face today. Uh, Governor Wolf's budget includes money for additional staff. This is um, money to monitor air quality, um, money to um, that will go for staff uh, for the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Implementation Plan. And also there's funding for the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources to hire 25 new park and forest ranger positions. So this you know, again, is a step in the right direction, but doesn't begin to address the environmental challenges we face. Um, moving on to the next uh, graph, this shows overall funding for the Depart Department of Environmental Protection for 2019-20 and this year proposed. So the proposed increase considering all sources of DEP uh, funds is an increase of 1.9%. Um, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources um, will see a total funding increase of 0.8%. Um, so I encourage people to go to our budget analysis and they can read more about um, the state of, of DEP on um, this proposed budget. So moving on to uh, criminal justice. Uh, the next graph shows uh, criminal justice spending over time. So this is in the light, the light blue line. 
compared to higher education, which is the dark blue line. So this year, the proposed criminal justice budget is set to decline by $73 million, or by 2.7%. So part of this savings is from a plan to close SCI retreat facilities due to decreasing inmate populations. And you can see from this graph that our state investment in higher education used to be higher than criminal justice, but that changed in 2011-12, um, and the gap has been growing um, ever since. So moving on, um, there are just a couple other budgetary changes that I wanted to mention. Um, the governor proposes $1 million um, in the Pennsylvania Agricultural Surplus Program. And that's basically the Department of Agriculture would provide funding to farms to cover the cost of food production. And this um, food will then be donated to charities across the state and, you know, as we can all imagine, um, you know, this, you know, would be very important moving forward in, in the next couple months um, and, you know, year. Uh, next, um, the governor is proposing $6 million in new funds to be used for grants for comprehensive gun violence prevention and reduction. And this funding will go through the Commission on Crime and Delinquency. And finally, I just wanted to end by talking a little bit about the Rainy Day Fund. Uh, the Rainy Day Fund is estimated to have $341.3 million by June 30th, 2020. Um, and, you know, we, we will probably be uh, tapping into that, as I can imagine, in the, um, in the year moving forward. Uh, with that, I'll invite my colleagues to come back on screen and we can answer any final questions. Okay, I'm just uh, pulling open the question box here. Um, one is, um, and we may have touched on this a bit already, but someone's asking, uh, school districts are in crisis. Many are facing the need to raise taxes even before the financial crisis. How can we raise taxes in a recession? How can the state take action to reduce mandates um, such as charter school funding, pension payments, special education mandates? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in on that, Jeff. Um, People who had a pretty good education macroeconomics or have been reading the paper for a long time know that one of the lessons is you shouldn't raise taxes in a recession. Um, and that's a lesson basically for the federal government. Federal government does not have to raise taxes to spend more money. It can run deficits. It should run deficits. We've, we've met every war um, that this country has ever had by issuing, issuing bonds and, and other debt. Uh, the debt, uh, the deficit at the time of World War II was about 30% of the gross domestic product. Our current deficit is, if I recall correctly, around 4 to 5%. Um, we're fighting a war against a, a, a very serious disease. We're diverting economic resources to fight it. We're having to sacrifice economic resources to fight it. The way to respond to that is with deficit spending at the federal level. And if necessary, to if if... Uh, we, if we feel that we're reaching the upper level of deficit spending, which I think we're a long ways from, raising taxes on the very rich. However, at the state level, things are different. States have to uh, balance their budgets. That's a constitutional responsibility. So we have a choice between balancing our budget by cutting spending or by raising taxes. And this is a case where if we raise taxes on the rich and to, to sustain our spending, or, or even to increase our spending, we will be much better off. And the reason for that is, is fairly straightforward. Rich people save a lot of the, their income. Uh, our fair share tax, for example, I mentioned raises $2.3 billion. Half of it is from the top 1% of households in the state. The average income in the top 1% is $1.6 million. And those people save a lot of money. If we tax them in order to sustain spending, uh, and schools, on Medicaid, on human services, on higher education. Uh, we will be adding spending to the economy uh, as opposed to 
cutting spending from the economy if we balance our budget by cutting all those things I mentioned. Um, if we tax them and we increase spending, we're doing even better. So you're, basically the idea is to shift uh, revenues from people who uh, spend, who save some of their money and spend it in ways that enables people who spend all their money to spend it. And that will actually give the economy some stimulus in Pennsylvania. So quite right, we don't raise taxes to the federal government, but the state government in order to keep spending going, we need to raise taxes. Thanks, Mark. Um, did either Diana or Steve want to add anything to that? Okay, uh, another question that we have is, um, someone's asking, is there any plan for people that just barely miss qualifying for public programs? This person says they may suffer the most. Yeah, I, one thing we can do is we can expand the eligibility for those programs. For example, one of the things people are concerned about with the unemployment compensation is, uh, what, if, what if people haven't made enough money uh, to, to, to get unemployment compensation. Well, we can lower the threshold of getting that money. There are proposals in, in mm -hmm. Washington to, to expand eligibility to, to workers who are self-employed, who are gig workers. Um, we can do those things. Um, similarly, we can raise, raise thresholds at which uh, SNAP benefits are provided. Now, when I say we can do it, it it depends on, on um, various different things. Some of those changes can be made through state regulation. Some changes can be made through state legislation. Some changes require federal approval. And sometimes approval could be done by, by federal waivers. And sometimes it requires federal legislation. There, the federal bill that uh, is being considered right now will expand unemployment insurance, for example, in a number of ways, uh, we hope. Uh, there's been debates about that. So I think our goal should be to, at both the federal state level, expand eligibility, eligibility levels, um, uh, raise benefit levels, and ensure as many people as possible get, get these benefits. Um, Jeff, one thing I'll underscore is um, this is an opportunity to do exactly what Mark said, expand eligibility, but then in a bunch of cases, we're actually going to be making policy changes that live beyond this crisis. So to take one old example, then a couple of newer examples, the old example is unemployment insurance, which when it was invented was talked about as an automatic stabilizer. The idea was that people who lost a job should be able to still have an income and still buy things. And, and that uh, in, the, in the 1930s, that was partly about um, purchasing power of, of the middle class, pulling us out of the Great Recession. But what's happened over uh, decades of conservative policies in many states is that uh, unemployment insurance is, insurance is now much less generous. It replaces uh, much less of the wages that people had before they lost a job. So that's something that we should um, uh, <clears throat> we should absolutely expand unemployment insurance now. We need that spending more than ever, and we need we need the money in the hands of those suffering people and families more than ever, but then we should keep that policy, a stronger unemployment insurance on the back end of this recession. And then in terms of new policies, things like paid sick days and paid family and medical leave, which again, too many workers, unlike almost all other advanced countries, don't get these things, particularly the low wage workers who are often on the front lines of, of this recession, which you know, is concentrated in industries like restaurants and hospitality, um, so we expand those programs, help get us out of this crisis, but then um, have an economy that works better for, for uh, uh, working people on the back end by keeping those policies. Thanks, Steve. And one final question that we have here um, is a question someone's asking related to housing issues. Um, it's how can we address the homeless community, uh, including foster children and families who are living in cars. So I think we're talking about extreme housing issues here. I mean, sadly, that's one of the areas where we don't have enough uh, policies in place to help people. So we can't just say, all right, put more money through the existing safety net. Although one thing we could do is restore general assistance, which help many people. Um, 
there are great agencies, you know, like Project Home around the state, which could do more if they were funded better. And I, I, my first thought would be, let's see how we can um, give them funds to expand their services. But the, the, this is one area where there's frankly no e no easy answer, because we we've been falling down on the job on this issue on uh, and helping these people for decades now. But but this is a case where again we should be creative because it's a great opportunity. I mean, the housing crisis has kind of crept up on uh, people, at least that's been our experience. It's sort of, um, again, when we talk to people across their, the state in 13 different places in 2018 about what they cared about, housing was an issue absolutely everywhere. Urban areas, yes, but also rural areas. And so um, lack of affordable housing has, you know, within the last three years, has been sort of recognized much more as a crisis in this country. and. Um, so when we're thinking about infrastructure and we're thinking about construction spending, we should be thinking about things like a program for facade improvement in the um, some of the neighborhoods of, of, of our cities like Erie and Philadelphia. We should be, if we've got potentially idled construction workers with critical skills, we should be putting those folks to work through creative programs that leave us with more housing on the back end um, and um, and housing affordability on the back end. That's just a variation on one of the most successful New Deal programs, something called the Civilian Conservation Corps, which um, ultimately more than uh, 3 million people over a decade um, did an enormous amount of construction, tree planting, socially useful uh, things, um, and, and for that got money and helped lift the economy. So again, we should we should use this crisis as an opportunity to build more affordable housing. Well, thank you, Steve, and thank you to Mark and Diana for sharing your expertise today. Um, we're really pleased uh, that there's been this much interest in this. Um, we have plenty of resources available on our website. Uh, you can find our 2020-21 uh, budget recommendations uh, and our analysis of the governor's budget there. You can also find our reg uh, recommendations related to responding to COVID-19. And of course, on our website, as always, uh, if you appreciate the work of the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center and Keystone Research Center, you can make a contribution uh, there on our website at uh, donate to Penn BPC uh, is the uh, sublink for that. Again, thank you, everyone, and uh, we look forward to continuing to share information and recommendations uh, about how to make Pennsylvania a thriving place for all of its residents. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Bye. Thanks, Bill.